live with Environmental Coffee House and Nils Paulson. Hello, how are you? I am so happy to have you. I am honored to be here. Thank you so much. I'm feeling good. Well, let me show your name so everybody knows who you are. Running for Congress in California in District 5. And you are, uh, District 5 covers, let's look at the counties, um, Sonoma, <laughs> Solano, Napa, Lake, and Contra Costa. So that's pretty cool. It's a nice area up there. Um, everybody's joining. This is great. I'm going to start with a little something I'm going to read. And it's, it's from the page that Nils, he'll tell you all about it, what he does. But the story of the transitions, and this is really awesome and it fits Environmental Coffee House's mission. Our vision is that every community in the United States has engaged its collective creativity to unleash an extraordinary and historic transition to a future beyond fossil fuels, a future that is more vibrant, abundant, and resilient, one that is ultimately preferable to the present. Thank you for that. And take it away, Great. Nils. My name is Nils Paulson. I'm running for US Congress in California's fifth district. Uh, running as, as an independent, and uh, that mission statement that uh, that Sandy just read is actually from Transition US, where the, my one of my two jobs I work as a communications director for uh, Transition US, which is our national hub of the global transition towns movement, cool. where completely like irrespective of what's going on in the political economic circus on the national and global level, people are just coming together locally to do awesome stuff and build thriving community resilience in our in our towns and neighborhoods awesome and that we will get into a little bit more about that because that was what was very attractive to me being that this is the focus of our whole thing is environmental and climate change and abrupt climate change and resilience and is there going to be a tomorrow and you're young there's going to be a tomorrow so let's hear about you tell us about how you became you a little bit about your education, which you have a lot of, and uh, go for it. Yeah, I, I'm fortunate to have, you know, experienced a lot of education in the form of like, you know, kind of getting my ass kicked by the world at times, and then also getting to learn a lot of great things. Um, no, I'm 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 living in, in Northern California. I was born in San Francisco and kind of grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, I moved to Manhattan when I was 18 to go to New York University. Um, I earned uh, BA degrees in history and English and a certificate in uh, non-governmental organizations. And I was living as a, as a young 20 something living in Harlem, kind of beginning to uh, find my place in this social movement, you know, find my place as a, as a peaceful revolutionary and found out that my father back in the Bay Area was sick with, uh, with leukemia. So I moved back here to take care of him. And that was just about 10 years ago or going on 10 years since then. Um, and in the sort of aftermath of that, after after he died in medical debt and our family lost our, our family home to, to medical bills, um, I ended up moving uh, from San Francisco up to this uh, this fifth district of California. I moved up to, to rural Lake County, um, initially kind of in my in my drive to find hermitage and find some like, you know, solitude in the yeah. in the pines. And what I ended up finding instead was community and people who were, you know, really building resilient community in, a, in an amazing way. And I went from always having been a political activist, being concerned about, you know, war for profit going on around the world and being concerned about uh, environmental pollution taking place in, you know, so many watersheds around the world um, and feeling that all and feeling concerned for the planet and not knowing like where to like really plug in or not knowing exactly what was actionable. Um, and once I moved to Lake County, uh, shortly thereafter, I found Transition Towns, actually, you kind of, which you prefaced this uh, this interview with reading the mission statement of Transition yeah, US. Absolutely. And I became, I became a local transition organizer, and I went from feeling completely disempowered, not knowing exactly, you know, where to start to realizing, oh, yeah, locally. I mean, I was also kind of going through this personal development growth, and like, at the end of the day, it starts within. And then it starts with where we are and, you know, it's just starting in my local community doing grassroots organizing around local water, building a healthy uh, local food shed and, you know, local food security. Uh, it's a strong local economy that, you know, what whatever happens, if the truck ever stops coming over the hill, we're resilient. We know each other. 
we're we're going to be able to you know weather whatever happens. Um, that's great because that's exactly what I told my husband when I was talking about this. I said it's it's almost like rural, like we live, and we know we have farms here, and we produce our own vegetables, and we try to. I've tried to instill a sense of community here, maybe not formally like your organization, but who knows what'll happen as well, a result. Transition by any other name is just as sweet. Like if you read Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken, I mean, there's like, there's a movement of movements happening and it's so huge that there's no way of even telling how big it is. And so, you know, the transition towns and transition is just a, 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 a part of this movement ecosystem that includes everything from immigrants' rights and labor and peace and women's rights and Black Lives Matter. And everybody's kind of like holding it down in their segment. And some people are doing local, you know, local food security stuff and building up local resilience and not calling it transition. It doesn't have to be called any specific thing. Call it what you want. But the movement of movements is huge. And what we saw, I think what we saw in the 2016 election is there was a flash of realizing that, well, we're not alone in this. We're not crazy for wanting to create, you know, social and racial and environmental and economic justice for all. We had Bernie up there talking about it and like half the country was on board for this. I feel like, you know, obviously if it, if it was him and Trump in the general election in 2016, we would, oh. we would have President Bernie Sanders right now. Oh, uh, would we be different? And A girl can wish. I Well, I mean, there's, there's the future. And w right now we've got we've got to deal with what we've got right now. We've got congressional midterm elections right now. And it, no matter who we elect to be our president, it's actually Congress that's setting the laws. And so if we got a president Trump, then we have to have a Congress that's going to resist and that's going to stand up forcefully and powerfully, you know, to prevent this corporate power grab. And if we have a president Bernie or a president Tulsi or whoever, you know, awesome, mm -hmm. we decide to bring as our, our people's candidate, in, in 2020, we've got to have a Congress that's going to write the awesome laws and, you know, protect DACA and raise the minimum wage and create a green energy economy. And all these things that we want, that we want Medicare for all, and we want tuition free public colleges. We need the Congress that's going to deliver. And oh, you so, have said it. And I, I so I ran in 2016. I was elected to be a delegate for Bernie in 2016. I ran for Congress my first time then. And uh, I learned a thing or two and I'm at it again. I'm running this year as a, an independent. And uh, fortunately, in this California top two primary, there's no Republican in this primary. So that that number two spot to challenge our 10 term Democratic incumbent, that number two Dang. spot is wide open. Who is, who is that his, again? His name is his name is Mike Thompson. And I like to you know come with respect and say that, you know, he's he's been doing his job for 20 years from the old paradigm. And the old paradigm is like being your good old fashioned, good old boy Democrat, showing up, voting like the right way on most things, but not not like standing powerfully for power to the people and for this this true justice that we're wanting to see in this sharing that's gonna benefit all people, our families and communities. There's no so, heart in it, but the heart. And right. it's contributions from corporations and you are not that guy. I take no corporate contributions, no super PAC money, none of that crazy stuff. In fact, when I decided to run the first time a couple of years ago, it was in response to this this episode of first meeting my congressman and expressing my concern about our environment and about healthcare and all the things that millennials and people of all generations care about and being told that I'll quote never get money out of politics and then getting wow. home and, and then getting home and like on that trip, Bernie announced that he was running for president. I felt like kind of like this positive omen. I got home and I started doing research and I started finding out just how deep the rabbit hole goes, uh, you know, in terms of this, yeah. the, the amount of corporate dirty money that's going into the, the war chests of even democratic representatives, including mm -hmm. mine was in the, in the millions of dollars, even a million dollars for a, one election cycle coming from these, these wealthy donors, but also these corporate Packs that uh, they're representing AT and T and Comcast mm -hmm. and Verizon and the biggest weapons manufacturers and the biggest Wall Street banks and all these jokers that we none of us want them to be running our government. Okay. If, if you talk to people in you know in the in the church meeting halls and in the you know on the streets and in the uh, the VA hospitals and everything, like none of us want this this big money in politics system. We all want a system that's going to actually reflect our needs. And we don't have it. And it's it, it's it's almost priced out uh, middle class and working class people from running for politics. Like I'm a working dad with two jobs and it's been everything I 
can do just to get on the ballot, get my 250 word statement sent home and like go to some farmer's markets and meet people. I'm taking on a, a Goliath political machine here. And I know I'm not alone. It's going on in districts all around the country that this movement's happening. Oh, it is. It's happening in our district. I mean, I'm working to get somebody wonderful to go against ours, uh, Tom Reed, Republican, Trump, you know what. I won't say it. <laughs> I could, but I'll keep this very nice. So um, we are doing it. And we have five wonderful candidates. Unfortunately, where I live, it's they're progressive but it's a democratic kind of place because we're very rural and we don't have a Green Party candidate in our district. So uh, it, to me, it's who's gonna get the climate denier out? <laughs> Let's get these people out that don't want to change. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, and, and in the race that I'm running in, there's uh, the corporate establishment Democrat, 10 term, 10 term incumbent. If most people who are watching this are probably aware Congress has the, the nine or 10 percent approval rating, but the 90, 95 percent reelection rate, which is just completely absurd. Oh. Uh, and then there's a couple of, uh, you know, non party independent and one green candidate in this race, too. And I'm, I'm offering myself as as a voice of the people. Um, I listen to the community and I'm offering to serve to be that bridge from the movement of the people, the movement of families and communities, people who are like living the effects of wealth inequality, living the effects of climate change. These huge wildfires have been happening in my district. I was displaced uh, by one yes. a couple of years ago and we, we feel it. We feel the housing crisis, the housing crunch. People aren't getting paid enough to like take care of our families. We're in student debt, in medical debt. Like we're dealing with that, you know, and we need a, uh, this movement needs to be taking yeah. over government. We need to be represented, all of us, us in Congress, represented. And so I'm offering myself as the candidate that's actually going to be able to unseat this Democrat. I absolutely think you are. <laughs> and it's we've got already, Nils, you are amazing. Thank you from Susan. So this is, uh, it's really nice. Um, let me ask you about, uh, what you were saying about can well just a little more about campaign reform about finance reform and your campaign specifically um and everybody i'll have a link up if you want to send your 27 dollars uh to help nils but how did you get to to feel that passion about we have to change it like that well it's every issue that we care about every everything that people were passionate about and i've met i've been in this movement for my entire adult life. And I've been, you know, feeling my own passion for political change and, you know, on the issues, right? And I've met so many people that are passionate about change on the issues. We want, we want, you know, pay equality for women and for people of all colors. And we want jobs with justice. And we want to like have bold climate leadership and we want peace and we want all of these things, immigrant rights. And when we look at why we're not getting those things, they, it's like there's these strands and they all trace back to this knot of big money in politics. And so that seems like if we're gonna, uh, we need to work on all of these issues. We need we need immigration reform. We need to raise the minimum wage. We need to create a universal healthcare system, all of these things. And in order to get any of that, we got to untangle this knot of money in politics. And that seems like the like the trim tab, like, you know, the to a Buckminster Fuller term, the trim tab, like how are, we gonna, how are we gonna turn this huge ship before it hits an iceberg? And like the rudder of the rudder, this little thing, if we tweak this, it's going to change everything. And that's getting big money out of politics, overturning Citizens United. Corporations are not people. Money is not speech. That's also electoral form, like mm -hmm. like automatic voter registration, ranked choice voting, electoral holiday, elections on a Monday instead oh. of a Tuesday. Like so like there's all in like uh I feel like felony disenfranchisement is, a, you know, a crime in and of itself, and we need all people to be able to vote. I mean, we're we're talking about actually like reclaiming our democracy, kicking big money out, and having a government that it, once again, or maybe for the first time ever, is actually of by and for the people. Maybe for the first time ever, because right. I right. am a certain age, and I have watched this over the last forty years. This rightward shift, even with Democratic presidents, it has totally. been, it has been, and we've been hijacked. Do you think that w in the United States, with what we've got in office now, and the the damage that they are doing, do you think that's going to bring the backlash needed to put you in office? 
I hope so. And to to your point of like witnessing us regress over the last forty you know forty years plus. I mean, I'm a I'm a I've been a public history teacher. I've taught public high school history, and I'm a student of a people's history. I was like strongly influenced in my own sort of awakening by Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky and some of these oh. other other things. And I mean, sometimes we think of the good old days of like you know the founding of this country and everything, and even back then the country was founded on slavery and genocide and patriarchy. And was there ever a time when it, when this country was really of by and for the people? And I feel like we started off actually like at a pretty low point, we set these lofty goals, but we were really like living in slavery and empire and genocide and gradually over the years, okay, abolish slavery. Okay. Women can vote, but we're not quite there yet. And like, we're on this March, we're marching to the mountaintop, you know, Dr. King was like, I can see it. And we're still on our way up there. Um, but we haven't we haven't really tasted it yet. We've had like some moments of like of glory, and hopefully we're we're on the verge of another one right now. And the, looking at the the 20, 2018 midterm elections, this could be the time. This could be the time right now, and it could also be that we're we're still tasting and wanting something that's a little bit further in the distance. But I'm living my daily reality and acting as if right now is the time and that's how it's going to happen. We all need to rise up and do just that. Do you feel that everything that's coming out about climate change and about the carbon, uh, the levels of um, CO2 in the air, uh, do you feel that we're at a tipping point? And if you do, or if you don't, can you explain? Yeah, I mean, depending on which scientist you ask, we're either approaching at or have regret regrettably already passed the tipping point. Mm. And like, we absolutely need to get off fossil fuels right away as a top priority. And we need to do it yesterday. And great, like, we'll set something a little more realistic, maybe like 2035. But even if we turned it all around right now, the next generation is still going to be feeling the I mean, there are already people around the world who have been displaced mm -hmm. due to climate change, climate related yeah. floods, fires, rising sea levels, like we're seeing it all and feeling it all. Um, I think the political reality is still catching up to that because a lot of us haven't really quite connected the dots yet. Like maybe there's like the people who are tuned in who are like, you know, reading Naomi Klein and, you know, who are on board with this change already and know that, you know, it's capitalism versus the climate and that we need to make big changes in our political economy in order to realize the, the, the environmental changes we need. Um, a lot of our brothers and sisters in this culture are too busy living the climate crisis to even have the political consciousness to do something about it. And like, it seems like a lot of times it's like getting worse in order to wake us up. We're going through these floods and fires to help wake us up. We're going through the, the Trump presidency crisis to help wake us up. Someone's like told me recently that Trump's a, Trump is a, a like an alarm clock there to wake you guys up. You know, yeah. you don't need to like the sound mm -hmm. of your alarm clock. You just need to get out of bed when you hear it. I just hope it's not too late. But of course, I'm older. I've seen a lot. You're young. You have a, a refreshing attitude. You have something that I feel is infectious and that should go out in a positive way to the people that you touch. I can I can feel it through just talking to you. I read it, you know, and and out of. I've interviewed a lot of candidates, but I do like the transition plan. I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. But first, let's hear about your district. What kind of businesses are in your district? And 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 I think you said you support the Off Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act. Uh, and how would you, knowing what's in your district, get this accomplished? How would you get them off of fossil fuels? Okay. Um well, we'll talk about the, the like transition thing, I guess, a little bit more in a minute. And I like to, you know, build a bridge from the sort of transition and permaculture and like the sort of local nonpartisan, you know, folks who are just working on their like homesteads and neighborhoods and towns and uh, working in our families to like live that integrity and actually building a bridge from that to our government. Um, because there's there's so many solutions and there, there are solutions that are happening right now all around the country from, you know, resilient local food systems where we're, you know, growing our own local food and gleaning and creating value added products and feeding the hungry based on this sort of model of like doing it locally and generating our own energy locally. My first job out of college was as a solar energy consultant. And it's like the solution comes up every morning, you know, like the, the, the solutions are right there. Um, so how in my district, in my 
California's fifth district, uh, which includes Sonoma County and Santa Rosa is a big town all the way out to like the, the East Bay, like Vallejo and Martinez. It's actually, there's a ref, what's called a refinery belt up there. Oh. Uh, where there's a, a couple of large fossil fuel refineries north of Richmond. People, a lot of people probably know about Richmond. That's not in my district, but if you go up a little further to Martinez and Venetia, there are additional uh, fossil fuel refineries. And so there's, there's a, a strong presence of fossil fuels in this district. There's a lot of sympathy. I think I, I judge and would assert that there's a lot of sympathy for fossil fuel companies on the part of our establishment elected officials that they're either taking money from these fossil fuel companies or they're you know having sort of backroom conversations with them uh and the people obviously like the the political ideology of uh, the average citizen in my district isn't necessarily republican or democrat or capitalist or socialist they're just i'm trying to make enough money to pay my bills and to spend some time with my family and like that's my that's my party is like i'm the like feed your family party like the like let's let's you know make sure we can afford our doctor bills and that's i feel like that's the average citizen in my district it's like there's a lot of migrant workers work in the wineries the the bosses put up the big signs for the person they want to get reelected. we know who the bosses want mm. people to vote for but like the actual workers are just trying to work and like how are we going to get this district off fossil fuels in permaculture and in the transition movement and like in my lineage, there's this idea of stacking functions and like doing something that's going to accomplish multiple things at once. So obviously getting money out of politics is going to accomplish many good things when we when we overturn Citizens United and change the way politics are done in this country. Also, when we invest in infrastructure, when we invest massively in like the kind of people have talked about this idea of a green new deal, there's like this, like this, a lot of people are talking about a national jobs guarantee. And the rhetoric kind of harkens back to new deal era policies, you know, the civilian conservation core, like the idea of like getting people working, if anyone who wants to work, get people working for more than a living wage, but a thriving wage, and people are working, and what are we doing? We're not just, we, we're definitely like, you know, fixing roads and bridges and things like that. But we're also building the green energy infrastructure that's going to get us off fossil fuels. So all over the place, you know, training up folks who are right now working for the fossil fuel companies, those are going to be the pioneers in our renewable energy economy. And like, we're going to get people to work all around, not just in this district, but in the entire country, we're, we got to become an energy leader. We need to go from being the 20, you know, the 25 percent of the global emissions for our little five percent of the global population. We need to go to being this huge, amazing climate leader that, you know, can help guide the way. It's a tall order. Uh, you know, when we try. look at what. Yeah, of course you're going to try. It's a tall order. <laughs> a tall when order. we look at the material I read every day, when I talk to the scientists I, I talk to who are, I think there's one with that he might still be with us who is living in Greenland and he's charting every day the Arctic ice melt. I mean, I just, I, 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 I love your enthusiasm. I think that it's needed, completely needed, because there are a lot of disenfranchised people who are very, very upset, unhappy, and do not think that we're going to be able to make the change. You know, totally. That we're not going to hit, that we're going to hit the building. I like to think that being that I have a daughter who is not that far from your age, that people like you are going to make a difference. And we don't know what's going to happen, but if we can at least make the, the the try to do what you're saying, we got something going. I mean, at the very least, you know, we can so to speak die on our feet rather than living on our knees. Like we could we could make yeah. a we had come together and make a last stand. And I, I, I am optimistic. I feel like maybe it's the fact that I've been in this like transition town sort of permaculture world of like grassroots solutions that are not dependent on fossil fuels. And this idea of transitioning from oil dependence to local community resilience where we're protecting the water, we're growing the food, we're building the local economy that's not even based on on dollars. We don't need that. We're so I, I, I've got this whole world of like solutions that I've been exposed to in the movement, and so I I, I do have some optimism, maybe a, a little bit more than your average like gloom and doomer on YouTube that you, you know, were telling me Hello. about. Um, but yeah. you know, like, the, the the 
urgency that's got to heighten the feeling of, of us needing to move and act on this right now. And so, yeah, it's, it is scary. You know, like, uh, you know, Richard Heinberg, you, you probably read, read a lot of his like environmental work. He's a member of my community. We, he shows up at our transition events. He's like, you know, he's, he's a great leader of our movement and he's expressed a lot of concern about whether it's too late. And, you know, I've, I've been movement building with a lot of indigenous elders who, you know, witnessed over the generations, things, you know, kind of get worse and worse as far as like what we're doing to this living planet that we're charged with stewarding. And there's a lot of reason to think that it's, it's a dark and scary time. And then there's also a lot of reason to believe that we could do something totally awesome right now. And you were, you know, looking at a Rob Hopkins video earlier before this interview started. He's one of the sort of visionary leaders of the Transition Town movement. And he said recently, um, there's a great film. I actually encourage people to check it out. It's called Tomorrow. It's a documentary. It's a French documentary that won the César Award, like the French Academy Award. And it's all about this movement, all about like toward this, this local resilience uh, project all around the world. And Rob was talking about how we've become so great as a culture at imagining the apocalypse. Like we've got zombie apocalypse movies and we've got your disaster you know, day after tomorrow. We're very great at imagining, you know, things going to crap and us having to pick up the pieces, the walking dead, right? And <laughs> we, need to, we need to cultivate the capacity to envision what it would be like to turn things around right now and thrive. And it's gonna be hard. It's hella hard. I'm running for political office right now. And it's hard for me to like get any, you know, visibility and recognition whatsoever, not not having the, you know, party establishment machine behind me, not having the corporate establishment money behind me. It's like I'm like to the you like few people watching this on Facebook right now, like honor it with a share because oh, we're, the, we're the staff. We're like building this movement mm -hmm. right now. And that's the only way that we're going to cut through the clutter of, you know, these huge, you know, budgets coming from military industrial Comcast giants. Like the only way that we're going to do it is by banding together right now as if our life depends on it. And our life <laughs> does depend on it. Yeah. I, I feel like my daughter's life depends on yes. it. Yes. How old is she? I've got a five-year-old. Yeah, five and a half. her life does depend on it, and you oh. know. But you're you're giving her tools that through your transition program, raising her with tools where she's going to be able to be okay. Right, and we we need to part of the thing we need to do for our our children and grandchildren and the future generations. If we're concerned about how things are going, the answer isn't to build up one's own material prosperity you know it's not like oh i'm concerned about my daughter and so i'm going to make as much money as i can and you know like retire from the the political scene it's quite the opposite it's that uh -huh. i'm concerned about my daughter i'm concerned about the seventh generation so all that commercial what i'm making money we put all that on hold because right now we have a very important task to do and that's we need to turn this ship before we crash into the iceberg like we need to make these big changes and the the wisdom is in the community it's not even like i don't have to think of all the answers there's the economic policy institute and the sanders institute like everyone's working on this we just need to like bring this this movement and its wisdom and the skills and knowledge from the streets and the research that's being done by all these you know excellent institutions and we need to take the government for us yeah, we do. We really do. We need to get rid of these people. And if we can't do it ahead of the voting block, I don't know if we're going to have to have a revolution, a real one. And I might be too old for it, but you're not. And however it looks and however it has to happen, our country, but other countries have to do this too, because there has been a rightward shift in the world towards fascism. It's all over. It's it's an infection, and so we are, we are up against huge odds. But I think with you and other people I've interviewed, it's a good fight. This is the revolution. You know, like that's this is the revolution. It's not, it's not like oh, we need to. We either need to electorally transform the system, and yeah. you know, you know, kick out the machine politicians and vote in folks who are representing us, or we need to have a revolution. My oh, sense is that is the revolution. And we're blessed in this country to have, you know, a culture at least aspiring toward democracy and at least aspiring toward, you know, human rights and the constitution and all of these things. 
We don't need to get out in the streets with weapons. We need to get no. into the voting booth. We need <laughs> no, to drive our neighbor to the voting. We need to make sure everybody's registered to vote on our block and you know, make sure they're educated about the corporate free candidates that are running in their district and you know, get the people who are you know meeting right now in, in the you know in the church basements to create a human rights group. That's the person who needs to be on city council and that's the person who needs to be running for Congress. Like that, that's the revolution. Like you, yeah. you, 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 like the, you're all the revolution, all of us right now. Like, and, yeah. and all of the people that are going to watch this all over. But it, you think you have a voice that will transfer to that average Joe, middle of the road, Trump voting person that is a bit, uh, mired in the propaganda machine you do it that's tricky i i i do so i mentioned in 2016 i ran i came in third in the primary the second place oh, wow. in the primary went to a republican and the republican that got second place in the primary had no campaign no website no name like he was not a member of a you know board of no one knew who this dude was someone must have but he, he won second place with 20 percent of the vote 19 percent, because of that r next to his name Probably. and unfortunately wherever you go there's some proportion of the of the community that's going to self-identify we don't we don't vote our best interests if we did we would all vote for the, this revolution we vote our identity and some people like think they identify with that, you know, red, whatever. And I'm hoping this time around in the absence of that Republican, that that the conservative folks in my community will recognize this idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And there are people from all political backgrounds. The, the real progressives have had it up to here with our corporate establishment rep. And the conservatives have definitely had it up to here with this guy being, you know, represented for 20 years now by the same yeah. dude. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who would rather have, you know, a sort of Ted Cruz Republican in there. But I'm hoping that folks will see me at least as a, as a, you know, a step toward having a representative that represents our community. And like, that's how Donald Trump got elected. I think a small percentage of Donald Trump's voters were these like, you know, alt-right, fascist, racist, neo-Nazis. Some of them, for sure, but that's not half of our country. I think people voted for Trump either because he is a Republican and they think they're a Republican, or even more overwhelmingly, because his campaign rhetoric was about draining the swamp. He said, oh, we're going to get money out of politics. Oh, we're going to, where did you, we got to, you know, defeat Goldman Sachs, because he, like, made it seem like Hillary was, like, the corporate, mm -hmm. which... By and large, I mean, she was definitely represented by a lot of big banks, but Trump positioned himself as the outsider and people were like, yeah, F that. They were like, they're with their pitchforks basically. And they elected Trump and the proverbial pitchfork. <laughs> right. And what did Chris Hedges call him? The human Molotov cocktail <laughs> the Molotov cocktail that is Donald Trump. And I can't say as I blame a lot of them. They were just like your average American is pissed off and sees that there's a an issue, a big problem. And I feel like that's why he's going to be a one-term president ultimately, if if not impeached. Because his, his stock among your average American has gone down. Some people are definitely tuned into Fox News and his propaganda machine. But I think a lot of people out there are like, no, we should have, we should have Bernie instead. I, I think that's, that sentiment is out there among, I got, you know, Trump people in my family. I got conservative aunties in my district here that I hang out with. Like, I know the sentiment. You know, they're, they're, we need to not make wrong. We, we need to not make these people feel like they're bad or wrong for having a certain belief. At the end of the day, we're all going to have to share this place together anyway. We, everybody needs food. When, when I went through these fires in my community, yeah. like, you see it. Everybody needs food. Everybody needs water, medicine, shelter. Don't matter what your political color is, especially in times of crisis. And I think also right now, like these little, these big fires and floods are still, I believe, just a little taste of what's possibly to come from the climate crisis. And like, we need to be, we need to be building a ship that's going to be able to take care of everybody. And so they might not, you know, vote for the, the revolution. They might not vote for the change that we need right now, but we're, we're still building the system that's going to take care of them. Do it. You, can vote, you can vote Republican all you want, but guess what? Like, 
I'm protecting your social security. Like it's this, this revolution that's going to make sure that your grandkids don't, you know, don't graduate from college a hundred thousand dollars in debt like me, you know? So we're, I don't know if they're going to, if they're all going to come around this time or if it's going to take more floods and fires and, you know, more bank bailouts and more egregious demonstrations of this calamity. But when the consciousness is ready to make this shift, we just need to flip a switch. Literally, like we just need to elect people that are of this movement. We just need to flip that switch. When they're ready, we need to have warriors like you and me on the ballot. And so I'm like, here again, yeah. and I'll do it again. And I'll feel like, well, I'm not going to run. You're ready. Vote for me, you know? And if yeah. you're not ready, God help us all. <laughs> wow. You know, I just, I wanted to bring up, we're talking about what happened with the tax plan that Trump had and the big headlines. I wore my Harley shirt. I'm not happy with Harley Davidson, but they did what every corporation would do. And I've been riding 32 years. We're a Harley family. I mean, we had, I've been, I've been on my own bike since I was in my twenties, but they sold out. They sold out They They, they paid their shareholders almost $700 million. They laid off workers. They're moving to Thailand. They're doing everything that we really did not expect, but we got lied to. So that's where I think it, it to, for these midterms, if the people that are that ride Harleys, I know a lot of them are very Trumpy or right wing, whatever. But if they realize, look what happened to your sacred institution. They're doing nothing for us, for you. They're leaving. They're going to Thailand. They're yeah. going to come and look at you and say, he's got an answer. He's got an alternative to what, what we're doing, what's happening. Something is wrong. Well, yes. I'm banking on. So we have a couple of comments. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Lee said, same can be said when Obama ran, but I don't remember exactly, Lee, what you um, what you commented that. You mean just like all the political uh, garbage? <laughs> because, all right, I don't know if he's going to. Um, oh, okay. He said, also said, so is Ford and Cadillac. So I talked about Harley and mm -hmm. they're, they're doing the same thing. So really the corporations that we want to get the money out, they're taking that money and running. So how do you get that message to people to say, we're not going to do this. We're doing something different. What do you think you can do in that well, in your district? I, I do believe at the end of the day, it's, and it's, it's a leap of faith, but I do I do trust us. I trust us collectively that if we have the right information, if we have actual truth and access to that truth, and if we actually exercise our democratic power and, and get organized and vote, then we're set. And we unfortunately don't have, you know, all of that ready access to that information right now, but, but we're capable of this right now. Um, yeah. What do I say to that? I say part of it is pushing for the change that we want to see and part of that is just being it, being the change and building the better system. And maybe like the mainstreams, as in 2016, wasn't quite ready to elect it, but we still build it. And like it's going on all, all across the country and around the world in the transition towns movement. And, you know, and grassroots organizing, grassroots local resilience building is all right. Well, big business, big government. We don't need your approval. We don't need your permission to do this. We're just going to do it. We're going to grow our food. We're going to protect this water. You know, we're going to we're going to build up our local economy and we're going to exchange hours instead of dollars. And, you know, this the whole system could come cr crumbling down for all we care. In my watershed, we're good. And we we do need to come together politically and change the system. That's why I'm here and I'm standing before you and running for office. Um, and I have we need about 50 of you <laughs> for every state, at least. How about, how about 435 of us? Yeah. How about that? <laughs> how about I that, mean, everybody? I'm just really totally encouraged by, a, a, you know, brand new Congress, this whole movement that, you know, in every district is, you know, with the, the sort of the vision that they're aspiring toward and the movement for a people's party and all these all these sort of coalitions that are coming together to get candidates like us elected all around the country because, I know that I'm not alone in this. I'm, I'm, you know, engaging in communication and like masterminding with other candidates like myself around the country who are doing this kind of work. And a lot of them are, you know, some of them are winning their elections. Some of them are showing uh -huh. really well and, you know, letting us know that there's quite a bit of hope. Um, 
so I feel I feel encouraged by other candidates around the country right now who are doing this work. Good. I I love this positive thinking, and you know, there because there really is uh, a lot of uh, negative thinking because I do a page on the environment, and there's not always much to report on that is positive. And I've taken everybody through the five steps of grief. Grief that if we have go through those five steps of grief, grief, sorry, grief, we can step outside of ourselves and not get upset about everything. But that way, we can make the changes that we have to get out there and vote. Talk to talk to people about it. I've talked to people about climate change and how do you even have that conversation? You know, even at the Christmas dinner table. But as we're talking about this, slide into your program now. The uh, transition. I closed it. I just love that, that you brought in the five stages of grief. Like, you know, I feel like any of us, we could chart ourselves somewhere on that. Somewhere uh -huh. on it's very important. Are we I, denying I it? Are we just like song. kicking and screaming about it? Are we like cocooning Embrace over it? it. Embrace yeah. your grief. Because if you're feeling it, then you know you're awake and you know what's going on. If you're feeling that grief and you have worked through the stages, it's very important because we have so many things that we're dealing with that are extremely serious. I can't say it enough. We are. And and then that's where it segues to you and what you're doing. What is the vision with okay. your partner in transitions and, and bringing a new world to life? Thank you. Transition US is uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. It's a it's a the global the, the national hub of the global transition towns movement. And it's also it's a it's a part of the puzzle. It's a part of the movement ecosystem. Um, and we're coming together locally in our in these transition towns all around the world to build local community resilience, um, you know, building these local food sheds and watersheds that are strong, you know, creating local alternative or green energy economy locally. Again, not not waiting for a big business or government to solve this for us. And we're building our community, you know, getting to know each other and, you know, map out the skills in our community and doing these skill shares and fix it fairs where instead of throwing stuff into, you know, the landfill, you bring your toaster to get fixed. And so like, you know, there's, there's these, you know, elder salons and, you know, local arts and media and all these amazing things that are happening all around the country and ultimately around the world and transition towns, you know, proper is just a part of it. And I, so that's, that's my, one of my day jobs is I work at transition us as the communications director and I'm in service to the community organizers around the country who are doing this work. And it's happened to the transition international gatherings, transitions happening. It was started in the UK, but it's happening all around the world. I'm like building solidarity with people in Japan and Brazil and Chile and, you know, throughout Europe and into, you know, South Africa and Croatia and everywhere they're working on this. And uh, it's, it's really cool. an amazing thing. And one that's of the things cool. that's so amazing about it is that it's all about honoring the work that's already being done. Like permaculture is still kind of like a jargony word that some people are like, what the hell is permaculture? But it's the idea of like permanent agriculture or like yeah. permanent culture. Maybe, you know, the Buddha would say nothing's permanent. It's all fleeting. But, you know, at least if we if we build our systems in harmony with the world around us, in harmony with nature, if we're no, not positioning this extractive economy that's trying to dominate nature, just like, you know, the concept of oppression and empire is inherently against nature because it's, you know, squashing the human will to be self-determining. And so instead of creating systems that are against nature, systems of extraction and domination and empire and patriarchy, and, you know, instead of doing that, we're building systems that are, that are holistically in tune with the world that we belong to. And it's something very indigenous about that. And in order to do that, you need to listen. And so you know, tra this transition towns movement, there's all these amazing solutions that people can, you know, look for uh, inspirational models of success around local food security, energy, water, arts and media, community building, emergency preparedness. At the end of the day, it's fundamentally this idea, it's an open source idea of listening to the community and gathering and self-empowering around the things we want the most. And it's all about like unlocking, That's unleashing awesome. that collective genius and like empowering well, the transition meetings when I founded a local transition initiative in my rural hometown in Lake County where I was living. Um, and we, we would put butcher paper on the wall and we got <laughs> 60 people together like, what do we want? And people are like, we want 
healthy, you know, local food. We want to protect our lake. You know, we want uh, education for our children. We want to make sure that, you know, the elders have rights that are being protected. And, you know, we want to build up the local community radio station. Like, all right, let's do it. Who wants to spearhead this project? Someone started a time bank. Now there's thousands of members. Someone, you know, started getting a local food round table together. And now there's an incredibly strong local food shed. And it's not waiting for anyone's permission. It's just doing it. And it looks different in transition towns all around the country oh. and around the world. There's, it's different everywhere, and that's the best part. It's just happening in inner cities. It is, yeah, sure. There's there's transition initiatives in many inner cities, like Milwaukee is one that comes to mind, where yeah. they've done a really successful. They called it the Victory Garden Blitz, where you know on one weekend they planted garden beds all around the city, and you know giving access to healthy food in places that are otherwise food deserts. But yeah, it's going on in. in plenty of uh, inner city environments Definitely. and also places where it's not calling itself transition. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, looking at like That's Detroit, for example. Detroit is like there so many people left Detroit, like Rust Belt, you know, high unemployment, high vacancy rates. Corporations are buying up a lot of those plots, developers, but also homesteaders are buying up a lot of those plots and, you know, buying up, you know, houses yeah. that are next to each other and converting the backyard into an urban farm. It's going on in Denver. It's going on in Seattle. It's going on in Santa Fe. Like it's all over the, all over the country. I'd like to see it happen in Buffalo, New York. How do, how would you get community leaders to get involved in having an association with transition? Yeah. I mean, if folks are curious about that bit, like definitely, uh, I would encourage people to check out transitionus.org and the Transition US Facebook page. Um, there's a lot of great resources. And again, you don't have to call it transition. Like you could just be getting, you know, doing community organizing on this sort of um, this open space kind of grassroots model where we're like, we're listening, we're going to other people's events and, you know, kind of building solidarity in that way. Um, it's all about honoring the work that's already being done. But if, if folks are specifically interested in transition, there is an amazing toolkit available People can I read, am. read the I'm transition book, look, watch there's a free movie on youtube in transition 2.0 i mean there's a, a bunch of tools even on the transition us website and like there's you you can find how-to guides and how to you know how to start how to start you know local food security yeah. so, you know, local csas and how to how to host a movie screening and like you can start getting people together around like wherever the energy is at Wow, this is amazing. It is it is like a, the blueprint and it works. It really works well with the Off Fossil Fuels Act for a, for a better future. That politically and transition in towns, I mean, it really gives me some hope. Eum. They call it hopium in some circles. But, uh, <laughs> you never heard of it? You never heard it. Hopium. Uh, it gives you, it, but it gives you that, well, some of them say it. It's a different connotation, but it gives a roadmap where we can go. And I really liked it. And it's great because, I mean, if definitely if we have like a disaster president like we have right now, we need to be resisting it. We need to be electing people who are, you know, holding this sort of visionary, bold leadership note of transforming the system. Mm -hmm. Just as if we have an awesome president, you know, like a, a, a the Bernie archetype of a president who's like, you there know, you leading the way we need to be electing the Congress and, you know, local state legislatures and governors and city councils that are going to be representing this. And whether we're do wh whether we're doing this local community organizing, you know, to transform a messed up system or to augment an awesome system, like we need to be building that local resilience. And once we have, once we have the government that's actually representing our people, once we have the, you know, the legislature and an, an executive branch that's that's really, you know, has the interests of our families and communities at heart, then we've got all these awesome solutions in place. The transition towns and the other local resilience projects that don't call themselves transition, but they're doing it anyway, that are building local food security, protecting the water. There's already all this awesome stuff happening. And so when we go to do our Green New Deal and build up the the, you know, fossil fuel free infrastructure that we need, we just need to fund the cool stuff that's already happening. It's like, and there are so many folks out there, conservative people that are like, I want a smaller government. I'm like, 
great. I mean, most of the awesome work <laughs> that's happening right now is grassroots anyway. Yeah. They're like, I want less taxes. I'm like, dude, I want less taxes on your average citizen too. What if we just tax the big polluters and tax the like high frequency trading and tax the biggest Wall Street banks and the people and tax second and third homes and like, you know, your average citizen will be paying less taxes. And we take this money that's our commons that was earned, you know, because we have a culture that allowed them to get that money, this money that represents other people's labor anyway, the, you know, the, this money represents the working class. Like, what if we put that back into our community in the form of healthcare? Yes. Education? Yes. And then jobs, building up the local food, building up the energy economy, like planting trees. We could be doing all of this. Am I, is this sounding like hopium? Is it sounding like I'm on something? I'm no. just like, I'm feeling the burn in 2018. Oh, we got to keep doing this. I love it. I think this is fabulous. It, it, you, you've just made me uh, completely enthusiastic for my daughter, for me, but for my daughter and for my community, because I'm going to share all this with my local community, even though we're already, you know, we're rural, we're not as connected as we could be. I think that this does translate to a lot of communities. You said it's happening in, in urban settings and all kinds of different people are, are starting to wake up and see that we need to change our paradigm that we live within. And you have a, a beautiful message. I love it. Do we have some questions? I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions. Check it. I just want to say that it's, this message is, is, crowdsourced. I mean, I believe in it. This is like of my heart. And I also want to just honor that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and like standing arm in arm with a community of people all around the country and around the world who are ready for this change. That's great. I think at that segue, we're almost an hour. And if anybody has any questions, um, Karen is asking about, have you read or studied MMT? I know you were uh, interviewed by Joy because I watched it. Totally. I mean, I've been schooled in some MMT just since, you know, in, over the last half a year, I've had people bring this medicine to me of MMT. And my answer is yes. And again, it's, it's kind of like transition towns by any other name is just as sweet. And like you may or may not call it modern monetary theory and you may not may or may not refer to the idea of, of federal jobs guarantee. You call it what you want, but the idea is we're investing in having a, a community that's functioning. We're investing in an in infrastructure based on the work that already wants and needs to happen. And so, I mean, in short, yes. And in long, there's a, a ton of amazing solutions that are needing to be implemented right away. Good. That's awesome. Well, I, I, it's, I really don't have a lot more. You really answered a lot of things I wanted to know. And I'm shouting out to everybody out there. Um, let's see. Heidi says, I love the Transition Towns movement. Thank you, Nils, for all your endeavors. Yeah, I feel the same way, Heidi. And uh, it, is, it, is very, um, it is very uplifting because I, I guess in the first time for a while, I feel like that there's really something that can be done. And I, don't, I, I know that, again, I read all the science. I read all these things that are just pointing me in the direction of, we're not long for the earth, but then again, we don't know. So we keep going. We fight and we try. Just well, like I mean, you, you're saying. Dr. King said it, you know, best too. Is like, you know, even if I knew that my time was up tomorrow, I would plant my seed today. Like we need to be building this anyway. You know, whether it feels like our time is up or whether we feel like we have all the time in the world, like what are we doing with ourselves right now anyway? Absolutely. Brilliantly perfect. I uh, would like to thank you. This has been very enlightening. And when is your primary? The primary is very soon. It's on June 5th. So the California okay. primary is June 5th, which is less than two weeks away at the time of this recording. And okay. if you're in this tape, then it's even closer. So I did in the chat, I just uh, popped in my, my uh, Facebook page and my website. I do encourage folks to uh, get involved and you know, find find some way, even if it's with just like some some social shares or whatever it is, find a way to support this campaign and support other kindred campaigns all around the country that are happening I've right trying. now. Yeah. I've been trying. I've been trying. Uh, Jeff says, how would Nils implement a jobs guarantee program like the one Bernie talks about in his district? Couldn't go without that good question. So the trip is and I've had like I've had local, you know, groups ask about like, you know, 
like how the, how I'm gonna like get money for this district and all these things. And my sense of what the mandate for a United States representative is, is okay. to build, is to create federal law. So that's the job of Congress. We're sending people from our districts to write national law. So the question of how I would do it in my district, the answer is I will do it for and with all districts. And so, I mean, th there's specific industries that I, you know, parts of my just district, you know, I wanna serve and support every family living in my district. And the way that a US representative will do that is by creating laws to get this done in the entire country. So it might look, for example, like you say, you know, a job guarantee, like the one Bernie talks about, it could be very much like that. And once we have that, you know, ratified, once we have that voted through Congress and enacted into law, uh, you know, we're going to need a, a president to sign it too. Uh, it's going to happen everywhere. And so the, that's the, that's why this stuff, it, I, I encourage people to support candidates in your district and out of your district, because it's going to take uh -huh. an entire U S house of representatives the Congress, Senate, everybody on board for this. And that's I why it's a lot of money around. Yeah. It's, and a I, I do hear that. it's a tall order, but let's let's get it in where we can and let's start working on it right away. And we your donation get, amount is what, twenty seven dollars? My donation amount? I mean I mean that you tell I, people I unfortunately had to donate myself a little bit more than that. I'm you know, I'm like a I'm a working dad and student debt and I'm you know doing my best to to put this, you know, campaign. Well, let's all send them some money. Yeah. <laughs> my average donation probably is around twenty seven, probably less. Uh, if you go to my website and just click the donate button, I've got a crowd pack page. You can donate five dollars. You can just endorse the campaign and like share this in five places and that's great too. But you know, twenty seven is great. Like I'm absolutely on the Bernie Sanders $27 model. And if you got that, I would totally honor it. Nils Paulson. I could see the future. I could see the future. Nils for president. I don't uh, know what year. 20. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even think that far. I don't even know if I'll be live then. But you know what? You will. And you are an inspiration. Thank you so much. I believe that there are no more questions. I think you did a very good job. I Yes, you absolutely did a very good job. You know, I believe you have a great chance. I have a lot of faith in you. And I think everybody that's following us does too. Well, I'm thank you for thank you for those beautiful words and then a great reflection. And I mean I'm I feel them. I'm inspired by the people in this movement who are doing this work as well. Like everybody who who comments and is there are folks of all sorts doing the work on the ground, right? And so I, I honor you, Sandy, for having me here, every single one of our, our viewers who are, you know, building this movement in your unique way. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Um, it's gonna take all of us showing up in the unique way that, that is ours to show up. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, everybody, uh, Nils, can you just wait and I'm gonna do my usual good night. Thank you all for coming. This was a wonderful interview discussion. There's a lot of information uh, with links I'll put up. And if you can, make a donation. I'm going to. I'm going to make a donation, and it'll probably be $27. But you know what? I think it'll be definitely a very good investment of my $27. So peace, everybody. Good night, and we'll see you soon. Friday night. Don't forget my Friday night show. <laughs>